Hello everyone, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 237. This week, the questions are taken from guide 282, which is the Kriegsmariners, Gneisenau, the specific ship, i.e. the Scharnhorst class battleship, and guide 283 to the Bainbridge, that's a US destroyer, along with the Wednesday videos about Jersey, the overall look at the millennia of maritime defense that's present there on the island, and lastly, the Zeebrugge raid in World War One. So, let's begin. UNSC Forward on to Dawn asks, given the level of fortifications that the Germans built on the island, what would it have taken for the Allies to invade and retake the islands by force, rather than waiting for the war to end and the garrison to surrender? So, if you're going to take Jersey, which is the southern and southern easternmost of the four Channel Islands, you would have to neutralise or retake Alderney, Sark and Guernsey first, and I haven't visited the fortifications of any of those. Um, so, you know, assuming that however they've managed to do that, they've managed to neutralise the other three islands, and we're looking purely at Jersey, you've got to, I think it comes down to two things. One is how easy it would be to affect a landing period, and the second thing would then be how many troops you'd actually need to retake the island, because once you've actually got a substantial number of troops onto the island, I don't think it's going to be that difficult to retake, because Jersey, the German garrison on Jersey, doesn't really have any armoured support, um, and doesn't have a particularly extensive array of mobile anti-tank weaponry. It's not exactly the world's largest island, so if the Allies were able to get a full combined armoured force there, including tanks, um, maybe some self-propelled artillery and so forth, then they should have a relatively easy time of going after the German infantry. Of course, there are the fortified strong points, but the entire island is within range of shore bombardment, and there are a lot of Germans proportional to the population. So, you know, it's it would be an incredibly vicious battle. A lot of civilians would almost certainly get caught in the crossfire, unfortunately. But without commenting on the land battle element beyond that, from a seaborne invasion perspective, i.e. getting the men to the islands, I don't think it would have taken a massive seaborne operation, mainly because most of the coastal defence guns, although there were a lot of them, most of them were either anti-infantry or anti-small ship weapons. There were a few that might threaten a larger ship like a heavy cruiser or a battleship at close range, very close range, but a heavy cruiser, a battleship, or even a light cruiser could quite easily engage those guns beyond the range at which those guns would be re any really effective against the larger vessel in question. Um, they, they did, of course, have plans to put much bigger, much more threatening weapons on Jersey, which could hurt pretty much any ship afloat but they never actually managed to do that before the islands were cut off and then obviously the war ended it would i think mainly be a, a problem of of selecting where on jersey you were going to land if you look at the overall layout of the german defenses there's not a lot of bunkers or anything like that on the north coast and that's for very good reason the north coast is mostly sheer cliffs um, there are one or two places where you could land, especially on the very northeastern tip, but they are so small, it would be very easy for a small blocking force to prevent anything further going on there. Um, now, by the inference, it would also be relatively easy for shore bombardment to clear that choke point, but it, it, if you're landing significant numbers of men and equipment, you probably don't want to use somewhere like that. St. Helia is obviously the obvious place to go because it's the biggest, most open area, but it's also therefore the most heavily defended. <laughs> and there's also defences and bunkers on the east and west coast where, again, beaches and so forth afford opportunities to land. Personally, if I was in charge of the landings, I would probably look at Cobriere on the very southwestern tip because... Unless I could bring enough force to just completely obliterate the bunkers, etc., 
um, straight up with battleship grade fire, which I can't necessarily guarantee because that ultimately is a relatively small set of islands. I don't think I'm going to get huge amounts of seaborne forces dedicated to the effort. Then, in the event of not having those forces, landing on the wider beaches or in St. Helier is going to invite a lot of casualties. Whereas, whilst there are bunkers at Cobrier, and there's the automatic mortar system, which you would have seen, the defences are relatively small in number. Because of the way that the ground is ridged, they are relatively exposed, and their firepower against more heavily armoured vessels, like, say, old battleships, is somewhat limited both in scope and in arc, at which point I would be, also considering the depth of water over there, I would be relatively confident in bringing an old battleship or two fairly close and basically bore sighting straight onto the bunkers and suppressing or blowing them away. Now, there, it is a little, it would be a bit of a choke point to expand from Cobriere along, but you can expand in two directions, which makes blocking forces a bit more difficult and equally means that once you've got any kind of significant forces on there, if you want to expand in one direction or the other, you can block a counterattack from the whichever direction you're not going pretty easily. At which point my temptation would be to block the northern approach and head east, because then if you head east, you're next going to run into, in terms of substantial resistance, this installation, which you can see in the picture. And if you can then overrun and capture that, you then have a fairly commanding position from which to go after St. Helier from the west. So that would be my instinct. Uh, land at Cobriere and advanced, advance east from there. Josh Thomas Moore asks, What was the plan for the Palmerston forts, and how effective do you think they could have been had they seen action? So the Palmerston forts originated in a period which was basically one of the periodic invasion scares that Britain had, albeit a somewhat more formal one, since there was a whole commission and a report and everything, and it worked off of looking at the rise of the French steam-powered wooden war fleet in the 1850s, because the report was commissioned right at the end of that decade, and they concluded that the Royal Navy wasn't in a position to defend Britain from invasion, so they recommended that all the key areas of the British coast should be heavily fortified. Uh, they realised that fortifying the entire length of the British coast where it was feasible to land troops was impossible. There's just too much coastline, too expensive. But places like Portsmouth, Plymouth, the Humber estuary, etc. should be. I mean, you can see this is one of uh, the forts at Portsmouth. Now, as far as coastal fortifications go, and most of you will be aware I don't hold them in particularly high regard, and also as far as British government projects go, which is something else I don't particularly hold in very high regard, this set of fortifications, at least in parts, seem to have been relatively well thought out. So one of, well, there's two, usually two major issues with coastal fortifications, one of which is people tend to put too many eggs in one basket or very few baskets. And secondly, a lot of coastal fortifications end up just not being particularly, you know, able to potentially give a lot of fire, not potentially able to take a lot. But with the Palmerston forts, using Portsmouth as an example, they actually relied on a lot of separate forts distributed over a relatively small area and then able to engage in mutually supporting fire which given at the time of their design their initial target is wooden warships that's actually not a bad way of going about things and they actually carry quite a lot of guns so you know this uh, circular fort they, these are quite famous in the UK there's three of them just in the Solent off of Portsmouth but this was incredibly heavily armed it carried the firepower of three or four ironclads um, or late era frigates or if you like the firepower of a late model ship of the line Obviously, you couldn't bring it all to bear in a single broadside because it's circular. But as I said, there are several other forts nearby that can provide fire support of this same type, plus forts on land at Gosport, Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight. And they were fairly heavily protected as well to stand up against return fire. But in terms of overall effectiveness, if they'd seen action, I think 
is more than almost any other period incredibly dependent on exactly when they see action. And I think this is part of the problem because the calls for the fortifications are started in 1859, 1860, but the actual system of fortifications doesn't start till the latter part of the 1860s and in most cases isn't completed until well into the 1870s, by which point the power of shipborne guns has increased, ironclads have become a thing and have gone through several generations of development, and whilst you can, to a certain extent, rearm the forts or just change their armament before they're completed to include heavier guns, a protection system that would be practically invulnerable to late-era wooden warships and very early-era ironclads is considerably less well-protected against late 1870s and early 1880s ironclads. And then, of course, you have to take into account they wouldn't be used in isolation. You know, they're outside major Royal Navy fleet bases. There would have been ships supporting them as well. So I think, you know, from the time they're completed through to maybe the start of the pre-Dreadnought era, assuming that they have contemporary guns equipped, they could have been relatively useful in combined use with the Royal Navy itself in the defence of various ports. But just size limitations and so forth once you get into the pre-dreadnought era even as a supporting ancillary they're not really going to be as too much use except as perhaps fire magnets purely because technology has moved on what i would also have a point out is that the initial plan at least budget wise they did cut it down a little bit but the initial plan as it stood cost just a fraction under 12 million pounds now as i said they did reduce that to something around eight nine million but then costs went up again but to give you some idea you had therefore a fixed system of defensive fortifications which is all well and good but to pick a ship a relatively large in fact one of the most powerful ships of the era for comparison hms minotaur of the minotaur class ironclads you could have got 25 of them for the same original budgeted price. Now, even if you massively cut the cost of the fortification program down, which is that they did, you could still get, you know, 15, 18 first-rate ironclad battleships for the same price. And if the concern which the commission came up with was, well, we don't think the Royal Navy is strong enough to defend us against incoming attack, if you what, nearly double the number of ironclads that the Royal Navy builds in the first 15 years of there being ironclads, then, well, that addresses pretty much all of your concerns, plus those ironclads can go into lots of different places. They can go overseas if necessary, and if there's an invasion fleet coming to any one fort, then, or one port, I should say, then even with the ones at Portsmouth, there's only a few million pounds worth of forts there to defend it, whereas if you have, let's say, if you take into account refits and such, and ships that might be overseas, a dozen full-sized ironclad battleships available instead that you can send in you can actually put more floating guns which have cost you more money in defense of the particular location guy bonfiglio asks in one of your recent dry docks you mentioned replacing the power plant of world war one era battleship with an inter in the interwar period how would this be done the idea of dismantling and then fabricating a new steam plant in piece by piece in place inside the hull seems like a major logistical challenge going through the deck would involve removing turrets and major sections of the ship would they go through the side or the aft maybe now this was bugging me for ages because years ago i saw exactly the perfect picture to illustrate this it was a picture of war spite mid reconstruction in a dry dock and for the life of me i can't find the thing again nonetheless Yes, usually you would actually go through the deck. Now, some ships were actually designed with parts of the deck specifically pre-built to enable the, you to go in and replace the machinery. Um, other ships obviously weren't, but even in the ones that weren't, usually a power plant replacement would be done during a complete refit and overhaul or most likely modernization which is why War Spite's a really good image for that. This one is just Monarch, because this is a, happens to be a battleship in a floating dock. But anyway, if you manage to see some of the pictures of the battleships that were modernised, whether that be Valiant Queen Elizabeth Renown and War Spite, or West Virginia, Colorado, etc., um, etc., et 
Congo, um, then you'll notice that actually they do remove the turrets and major sections of the ship. You know, the superstructure gets pretty much raised because they're rebuilding it in a new form anyway. The turrets and guns all get taken off because usually they're having modifications made to them, usually elevation increases, etc. So that leaves you with a pretty bare-looking hull anyway. And then, because you're usually also removing casements and installing turreted secondaries, albeit not so much in Warspite's case, you also tend to actually take off the first deck level or two. So the picture that I saw of Warspite basically showed in part she was basically down to her main armoured deck, at which point, yeah, if you're going to improve that armoured deck anyway, taking out a chunk of it, lifting out the machinery wholesale, and then putting in new boilers, etc., etc., that is pretty much how you replace the power plant, which is why these modernizations take two or three years at a time to pull off, because you're effectively dismantling half the ship and then rebuilding it. Christopher Babylon asks, Why was it so difficult for the Axis powers in World War II to come up with a dual-purpose mount? I know the Japanese came up with a twin hundred millimeter somewhat into the war, but the Germans only really dreamt of one, and what about the Italians? Well, as I've explained in some detail in previous dry docks when looking at things like the 5-inch and the 5.25-inch in US and Royal Navy service respectively, a lot of it comes down to the arguments over what specifications you actually want. Because a dual purpose mount is always going to be more expensive and more complex than a single purpose mount. And usually heavier, unless you happen to be the US, who somehow managed to make surface action only 5 inch 38 heavier than for dual purpose ones, but never mind. And if you're going to put that amount of expense into things, then you really, really want to have a gun that's going to do well in both sets of parameters and in the US they settled on the five inch as said uh, now as I've also said on that they did have to make some sacrifices and the British went kind of the other way so if you have if you like the perfect balance whatever that might be of anti-surface capability and anti-air capability the five inch 38 falls just a little bit on the side of appreciating better anti-air capability versus anti-surface the 5.25 falls just to the other side where it's a somewhat it's slightly better at being an anti-surface gun than an anti-aircraft weapon but once you start to slide away from that knife edge you very quickly get into the realm of well actually we want a much bigger heavier gun to be able to stop anti uh, to stop destroyers and so forth so a six inch usually but we can't make a six inch into a dual purpose, at least in the pre-World War II period, because that's far too complex and difficult and it doesn't really work. And therefore we're going to have to go with a much lighter anti-aircraft weapon and the traits that you want in an anti-aircraft weapon, fast tracking, high elevation, not huge amounts of recoil, etc., etc. You can get those much better out of a lighter weapon. So with the Germans, the 105mm, as you can see here with the Italians, the 90mm. And in both cases, they ended up going for a, roughly speaking, 6-inch anti-surface secondary. Now, that's not to say that people didn't try to make heavier guns dual-purpose. The British tried to make an 8-inch dual-purpose gun with a county class. They looked into whether the 6-inch guns could be dual-purpose on the towns, and, well, the Leanders and Arath users at that point as well. The French really wanted their 6-inch secondaries on the Richelieu's to be dual-purpose, but that didn't work out either. So a lot of the time, I think the reason that the Axis powers generally, obviously Japan accepted with the Twin Hundred, struggled was because they went, if they looked at it at all, they went for the heavier end in terms of anti-surface firepower, i.e. a 5.5 or 6 inch gun, depending on Japan, Germany, etc. And rapidly came to the conclusion that it wasn't really possible to get a practical heavy anti-aircraft gun that way and then rather than sacrifice anti-surface firepower they just decided well we're not we're not prepared to downrate the caliber of our anti-surface guns so therefore we're going to have to split the difference and have a more optimized and heavy anti-aircraft gun in a smaller caliber and given the development time to actually make a working dual purpose mount by the time they'd made that decision and potentially realized the folly of it it was too late and the war was halfway done <laughs>
Wildcard asks, even with the use of spotting planes, how effective were the monitors during the Zeebrugge raid? You said they're initially there to distract the defenders from the block ships and to smash up targets of opportunity. But given the casualties on the British side, would you say they made a difference? Also, was their secondary objective a success, i.e. smashing the place up? Well, I think there's a bit of a distinction to be drawn in that the monitors aren't going to be acting in direct fire support on the mole for the British forces. So that battle is is kind of separate to the what the monitors were doing. And obviously that's where most of the casualties are incurred. But in terms of smashing the place up, um, during the Zeebrugge raid specifically, not a huge amount was smashed up. Uh, monitors bombarding Ostend later on had a bit more success in that particular role. But the main difference that the monitors made was more distraction than anything else. Uh, they had done a previous bombardment of Zebrugger during the day with aerial spotting. Obviously, during the main Zebrugger raid, which was during at night, um, you're not going to get aerial spotting at night in World War One. But... What they did do is, you know, the big guns, which might otherwise have either been turned on the block ships or the uh, assault ships, they were then concerned with the fact that there's a bunch of 15-inch shells screaming in from out at sea, and so by distracting the heavier German guns, it meant that the assault could actually get underway in the first place. So, in terms of actually directly causing damage to anything significant during the Zebrugge raid, the monitors didn't make a huge difference. But in terms of enabling the raid to succeed by getting the guns that could have completely forestalled the raid before it even got into the port um, by making them shoot at the monitors rather than those ships, then they did succeed. 535 Phobos asks, I've been reading Campbell's Jutland, and at one point he describes Malaya intending to fire its secondary short to create a screen of splashes for herself. Was this a common tactic, and are there instances of this working to foul the enemy's range? Also, I wonder how short exactly are we speaking here? This kind of tactic was actually repeated multiple times in both world wars for pretty much similar reasons, or basically to obscure the ship and occasionally to try and deal with uh, attackers. So Nelson did it with her 16-inch guns as an attempt mainly to dissuade Italian torpedo bombers with the side effect that they hoped that if an Italian torpedo bomber flew into a shell splash, it might be taken out. Bismarck's reported to have done it against the swordfish, and, as you mentioned, you know, Malaya at Jutland. As far as whether or not it worked, I don't know offhand. I certainly don't recall, during when I was researching for Jutland, I don't recall anything in the German sources saying that they were particularly perturbed by this kind of thing but we do know from more general battle sources and of course things like the death ride of the battle cruisers that if you have a bunch of shell splashes that aren't your own going off near a target ship it is very possible to get distracted and you know think that uh, are these are my shell splashes are these someone else's splashes um and make the wrong corrections with your fire control systems Plus, of course, you know, if you do fire a, a wall of shell splashes ahead of you, then not only does that visually obscure you from the target, but if they try and take a range bearing to that, well, the shell splashes are always moving, so it's going to be harder to get those in focus on your rangefinders. But even if they do, then the range figure is obviously going to be wrong. So there is a certain amount of theoretical utility to it, and the general principles observed from having multiple shell splashes from different sources around ships would indicate it should be somewhat effective, assuming, of course, that you are creating the screen directly in between you and a ship that's actually targeting you, because obviously if you create it off to one side, it's not going to make much odds. Uh, in terms of how short we're talking about, you're talking about a few hundred to a few thousand yards, depending on the gun in question and the minimum elevation of that gun. So if you're talking you know, Malaya's secondary six inch, they can hit the water down to a few hundred yards away from the ship, although obviously you'd want to have a minimum safe distance for shrapnel and splinters and so forth. Whereas if you're talking about something like the main armament being used to deter torpedo bombers in World War II, uh, that's going to be landing considerably further out, if for no other reason than the safety purposes I outlined, because obviously a 15 or 16 inch shell exploding in the sea is going to have a considerably larger blast radius in terms of its shrapnel than a 5 or 6 inch gun. 
and generally speaking the main guns in a battleship turret tend to elevate uh, well elevate depress i guess is the correct term um to a somewhat lesser extent than most secondaries do chuck sneed asks suppose a shell hits the edge of an armor plate say where the armored portion meets the unarmored does the difference in hardness experienced by the shell impart a twisting moment and could it cause the shell to break apart or would the effect be negligible uh yes it absolutely would i mean you'd be incredibly lucky or unlucky i guess to have a shell hit exactly on the edge of where one armor plate ends and the unarmored portion of the hull begins but it you know, it does happen uh wasn't able to find any specific pictures of it immediately but here's a picture of war spike being hit to show the kind of entry wound of a shell nonetheless exactly what the effect on the shell would be depends partly on what kind of shell it is not in terms of size but more in terms of construction because some people's armor piercing shells were very rigid others were a little bit more flexible um some would bend um in forces like that others would shatter also the kind of uh, armor piercing head what kind of shape it is and exactly where the shell has hit so for example um if the sh if you if you imagine a shell let's for the sake of argument assume it's traveling flat horizontal we know that's not actually likely to be the case but it's easier to imagine so if the shell hits with say one third of it the lower third impacting the armor and the upper th upper two thirds impacting the unarmored portion of the hull then some of the better built shells will bite a chunk out of the lip of the armor plate and probably ricochet slightly upwards um, they might also start tumbling but the general direction of travel may well be on an upward so basically they're bouncing off the upper edge of the armor plate if it hits dead on i.e the very tip of the shell hits right on the very top edge of the armor so the lower half is hitting armor the upper half isn't well a the shell is very likely to come apart because of the different forces being exerted the upper part is just wanting to continue and not meeting much resistance the lower part is very much meeting a lot of resistance and deceleration um but also the armor might then still fail because it's only you know it's the it's the lip there's not as much support as it would be if it was hit somewhat lower down um and if the armor fails first a big chunk is blown out of it before the shell fails then the shell is going to definitely start tumbling end over end and probably disintegrate and if the shell hits in say a state where two-thirds of it hits the armor and one-third hits above then it's likely that this will twist the shell somewhat towards the armor yeah, obviously if it's hitting perpendicular it's already doing it's already on board with that but if it's hitting at an angle then the resistance will probably cause the shell to curve so essentially the more of the shell that is not hitting the armor the more likely it is to deflect but also break up and the more of the shell that's hitting the armor the more likely it is to twist in the direction of the armor plate because that's the bit that's slowing down more but there in all cases there's going to be huge amounts of rotational force on the shell so anything but the absolute heaviest built shells are may very well break up at that point um if the armor doesn't fail quickly enough david fryman asks on the dry dock and in various videos it's often vividly described how kamikaze attacks on armored decks had a tendency to bounce off are they any, are there any records of a kamikaze pilot surviving his contact with a multi-ton trampoline most of the time no this is a kamikaze that did do exactly that bounced off the deck of a british armored carrier and fetched up in the water and this is kind of the problem if the kamikaze comes in and hits an armored deck at a shallow enough angle that he bounces well there, there's two things that mitigate against his survival firstly he still had a several hundred mile per hour impact with a wall of solid steel and the human body doesn't tend to react very well to that so probably killed on impact but if it was a really shallow event um then he may have survived that then in either case it's still a several hundred mile per hour impact 
at which point the kamikazes tended to have enough momentum to go sailing off the side of the ship, which is, again, what's happened in this picture, land in the water somewhat beyond the carrier, at which point you're dealing with another high-speed impact, this time with the water, which you probably won't survive if you've managed to survive the first one, and then the bomb that you're carrying might explode, or the aircraft might catch fire, or both, which, again, has happened here. So you've effectively, at best, got to survive two several hundred mile per hour crashes and then a severe explosion in order to walk away from it. And if you come in at a steeper angle, such that you don't have enough horizontal momentum to slide off into the ocean, well, then you've just slammed straight into three plus inches of solid steel and come to a very, very rapid stop, which, again, people don't tend to survive. Now, th there may be perhaps uh, an isolated case here or there where a kamikaze pilot might have survived. I guess a very, very shallow angle impact where perhaps the bomb was scraped off on the deck and then he slid a long way along the flight deck, losing a bunch of momentum, then fell over into the sea. That potentially could be survivable. I'm not immediately aware of that, of that actually happening at any point, though. Um, I do recall from survivors' accounts at one point somebody who was on the flight deck and saw a kamikaze impact actually related how he witnessed the kamikaze pilot looking at him as the aircraft careened off the side of the ship so i guess at that point the pilot had probably survived the initial impact but then didn't survive the subsequent fall into the sea and explosion of their aircraft Jake Miller asks, what do you think caused the US to not lose any battleships at sea apart from those at Pearl Harbor was it better escorts, more or better anti-aircraft guns, better protection, speed, firepower, damage control, crew skill, or a combination of many or all of these? It's, a com I think, a combination of all of those plus timing. Um, obviously, here's USS Pennsylvania, who came close to being lost right at the end of the war, but wasn't, thanks largely to fantastic damage control by her crew, as related in the uh, video back in December. But when you look at the list of lost allied capital ships, um, British and American, you'll notice that actually after the 10th of December 1941, when Fort Z was sunk, neither the British nor the Americans lose any battleships after that. Obviously, North Carolina gets torpedoed, and that poses a danger. Pennsylvania, as we've just mentioned, gets torpedoed. That has danger to it. But in the aftermath of 1941, U.S. battleships, generally speaking, are not really placed in a position where they're at in danger of being sunk, with a few notable exceptions. So you look at, say, Surigao Strait, the U.S. battleships heavily outnumber, and given it's a night fight engagement with radar, heavily out-tech their opponents, so they're not in a huge amount of danger there. Guadalcanal, you know, Washington and especially South Dakota, in theory, are in danger, and there were plenty of long lances in the water that night. If Kirishima had had AP shells from the beginning, perhaps it could also have been different, um, but it wasn't. But that's probably about the closest outside of the two torpedoing incidents that you'd uh, run the risk of things. And, you know, Philippine Sea, as we've mentioned in previous videos, Admiral Lee had the opportunity to take his ships into a surface action, but declined because why put your ships in additional risk when you can just hit the enemy with lots and lots and lots of aircraft? And at Leyte Gulf, you know, Task Force 34, if it had been formed, potentially might have lost a ship or two fighting Carita. But thanks to Admiral Halsey's decisions, that battle never came about. So in large part, the times where there could have been a serious capital ship confrontation, the US either declined, had massive superiority, or just wasn't there. You know, if the Italians, for example, had sailed at the conclusion of their involvement in the war, the covering force at that point was all Royal Navy capital ships. Uh, theoretically, if Jean Bar had got her guns sighted in a bit better, then perhaps Massachusetts might have been at risk at Casablanca. Um, but you know, again, it didn't really come off. So most of the time, the US ships just weren't in situations where they were at serious peril. And in the few cases when they were, primarily Guadalcanal, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, their damage control was able to deal with the issue. 
Joe Svoboda asks, This is the first ship I've seen with an awning that covered approximately 75% of the deck length, as seen in pictures of USS Stewart and USS Hopkins. Is there any particular reason for this other than protecting the crew from the elements? So this is from the video on the Bainbridge class destroyers. And, well, there's a few different reasons. Usually the quarter deck of ships during peacetime when it was particularly sunny would have an awning over it, except that obviously, as you can see, um, the lower portion of the upper deck of a, a Bainbridge class is pretty much most of the length of the ship. Um, and it's not just the sun. I mean, the sun is an issue. You can tell, and heat generally, you can tell from the spacing of the funnels that an awful lot of the interior of a Bainbridge is going to be made up of engine rooms. So you want somewhere to come and cool off. And if you're trying to cool off in the middle of fairly intense sunshine, that's not particularly pleasant. So with a relatively small amount of deck area for the crew, and cover up as much of it as possible to you know allow them to operate uh, in a degree of comfort where, where you can. It has a minor beneficial effect in that pretty much all of the ship's armament, bar that forward gun you can see there, is also covered, which will make main care and maintenance easier generally. But the other thing which you can see is that the ship's bow is still somewhat whaleback-like, which means it is going to be taking a lot of water and spray green over the bow more often than you might think for your average destroyer. And a lot of that water is going to sluice back and over. And by having this full length cover, it also means that when the ship's proceeding at speed, the crew who are trying to do their duties on the deck after the bridge are not going to be constantly experiencing a salt water shower, which is not particularly good for them. And you can see in this particular shot, they've also rigged weatherproof covering the forward of the, the forward gun, and there's also a little version of it stuck atop the bridge as well. Um, so, yeah, it's a combination sun shield and anti-spray shield, because otherwise you're going to end up with a lot of people who have been drenched in salt water and then exposed to burning hot sun, which is not a good combination at all. Sky asks, if battleships usually fought at long range and rarely got into point-blank range, why wasn't more armour thickness dedicated to the deck to prevent plunging fire instead of to the sides of the ships? So there's some doctrinal reasons and some practical reasons. The practical is that whilst pretty much all of the battleships that we know of were being designed, except for maybe Vanguard and arguably maybe just about the Iowas, pretty much everyone else was designing ships before radar or most certainly before gunnery control radar at which point you have to take into account that whilst you might want to fight at long distances it's entirely possible with rain night fog etc that you might end up fighting at shorter distances and therefore you have to armor your ship against that because well if you're only armored against very long range fire and then entirely predictable weather, and again, remember, night is a form of weather uh, for these purposes, so, you know, at least 50% of the time your ship's going to be out there, you do not want your ships to be able to be torn apart by something like a cruiser or a destroyer. And then you've got the doctrinal element of how do you define long range? So different navies had different ideas of exactly what constituted long range. Ironically enough, in World War One, the Royal Navy was probably amongst the proponents of the longest range gunfire whereas by world war ii the royal navy had not quite but almost switched itself around to the point that the royal navy expected gunfire to be opened at reasonably long range but their doctrine rather than sticking around at that range was to close as quickly as possible to sort of fifteen thousand yards or less which is one of the reasons why the king george v were so heavily protected another reason is at what range does the plunging fire actually start to matter? So this diagram I've created uses the King George V as the template because it's got fairly easy to understand armour cross section and also uses the King George V's 14 inch guns because they are actually at the lower end of things. So in terms of muzzle velocity, so it will actually plunge quicker. This has approximately, at, at least mid-combat distances, 
about the same plunging characteristics as a 16 inch 45 in if you're interested it's about 0.3 degrees difference in angle of fall at 20,000 yards now i've colored these blocks in three as you can see now light blue is the block that up to the half section a shell coming in along this vector at about 18 degrees will hit the armor deck the two other blocks are shells coming in on a vector on the same 18 degree vector but if they're coming in on in these blocks they will hit the belt armor the sort of mid blue is the above waterline belt armor and the darker blue is the below waterline belt armor and collectively you can see that at, even with a gun that actually drops relatively speaking quickly the amount of side of the ship that might be hit is actually greater than the amount of deck in terms of the column of air in which the shell may, may be in order to la make that impact. Now you might argue, well hang on, what about the other half of the ship? This is only a half cross section. Surely that's going to double up the width of the deck hitting section. And that is true. However, you've got to factor in that in almost all cases, a hit like that will be passing through quite a bit of the superstructure, at which point that shell is probably going to detonate somewhere in the superstructure and not actually make it all the way down to the de armor deck or even if it does it's probably going to be slowed quite significantly and if you're looking at the higher velocity weapons such as you know bismarck's 15 inch guns or uh, richelieu's guns littorio's guns or the 16 inch 50s on the iowas their angle of fall at this range 20,000 yards which is a relatively reasonable range for battleships to be fighting at even if it's on the maybe the slightly shorter end of the start of expected battle range but all of their angles of fall will be less which is going to mean even less space for the deck armor hits and a lot more allocated towards the belt armor hits it's only when you start to get out to sort of 24 26 28 30,000 yards that you start to see the deck armor become appreciably more likely to be hit than the belt armor with most guns and towards the upper end of that you're edging towards the range at which as i've mentioned before any competent sailor can just dodge your incoming salvo assuming you'd aimed right in the first place but the final thing is also what is actually needed because the other thing you can appreciate from this is that the deck armor covers a lot greater an area than the belt armor therefore to cover let's say a foot of the ship's length with belt or deck armor because you're having to go across a much greater width the deck armor will weigh more for a given amount of inches so if you, if you increase the deck armor by an inch it's going to weigh a lot more overall than increasing the belt armor by an inch and when you look at that angle of impact assuming the belt is completely vertical obviously at this particular cross section of king george V, it's not but for the sake of argument let's assume that and i know we get angled belts and so forth but that actually makes it just easier for the belt armor but as you can see if we assume just a slab side then the angle of impact is 18 degrees off of perpendicular and 18 degrees off of perpendicular is gonna be pretty tough for the belt armor it doesn't get much increase in apparent thickness from the angle and so it has to be quite thick to resist the incoming shell whereas if you then look at the deck armor the shell assuming that it hasn't been distorted or knocked off course by passing through that upper unprotected area is going to hit at 18 degrees off of being parallel which means it's going to hit at 72 degrees off of the perpendicular which massively increases the apparent thickness of the deck so if you only need a th relatively speaking thin amount of deck armor to deflect most reasonable shells even at fairly considerable ranges then there's no point in taking the increased weight penalty to make you even more invulnerable when it's not necessary brian smith asks you've talked about the various redundancies built into warships are there certain countries that seem to be more into redundancy and others that were not about redundancy as much? Who would you put at the extremes of maybe too much redundancy and who did not do enough redundancy? I think you need to split it slightly into what I would term human redundancy and mechanical redundancy. But 
at least as far as I can see so far, the people who were the most avid devotees of the Department of Redundancy Department were the U.S. Navy, going aboard the various ships, especially being shown around them by people like Dr. Scholes. The sheer amount of stuff that has to go wrong on a U.S. ship to at least a, a World War II era fast battleship to stop it being able to fight back is absolutely colossal mechanically speaking um you know as i've said before you know to to stop south dakota from being able to fire back accurately at her attackers she had to undergo a critical cascade electronic failure plus having basically most significant portions of her exterior set on fire uh, which and it had to be at night, because to be perfectly honest, if even if she had been in that situation, if it had been during the day, there probably would have been at least two or three rangefinder positions which were still operating and able to get range. But as it was with the electrical failure, her radars were blind, and with the fires and the smoke, combined with the fact it's night, ruining obviously night vision, then that meant her optical rangefinders were blind. But that's how bad it has to be. And whilst... Every Navy did go in, especially amongst big ships, in a big way for redundancy. I have yet to encounter anything that's quite that level. Now, of course, people do try redundancies in different ways. And sometimes, uh, you know, they can design it heavily for redundancy, but they can get it wrong. And now before we move on to that, the other element I would mention is, as I say, the human redundancy with the human redundancy, it's fairly easy to point fingers at poor old Imperial Japanese Navy and say they didn't do enough in terms of redundancy for the human element because that's the damage control parties. They had very good, very specialist damage control parties, and as long as they were alive, they could do a remarkably good job. If they, however, were not alive or they were cut off from the bit they needed to get to, both of which are perennial hazards of a ship that's being bombed and shelled to pieces, well, we saw it places like Midway, uh, what exactly could happen at that point. Whereas if you look also at Midway um, and at various Cara battles, when you have the US Navy and several other Allied navies where everybody who is aboard the ship also has a role in damage control and relevant training, therefore, then suddenly it turns out that, you know, even if somebody who has very specific knowledge and would be ideally placed to deal with a specific situation if they might be dead, injured, or otherwise cut off, the rest of the crew can be getting on with stuff pretty well. And when it comes to the mechanical side of redundancy, maybe not in terms of who didn't do it enough, but who maybe made the most missteps, I, I'm more hesitant on this element of things, but I would hesitantly point my finger at the Kriegsmarine, because you have things like, you know, attempting redundancy for primary range finding on capital ships by splitting the cabling at the upper levels of the superstructure. They do have this armoured tube, the same that as US and British battleships do, going up the central structure. But unlike US and British battleships where it goes all the way up and the redundancy is have lots of different range finders and uh, an armoured tube against splinters and blast, the Germans try and you know, take the cables in multiple directions on the theory that one cable could get severed, but multiple cables probably couldn't. As it turns out, in Bismarck's final fight, that's not actually necessarily true when you talk about the blast and splinter effects of very large shells. So it was a good idea, but just didn't work. And the same thing with a lot of their mechanical systems, like you see with, you know, Prince Eugen's engines packing up towards the end of the war when she's uh, over in the USA. A lot of German mechanical systems, at least for their World War II Navy, seem to have had other systems to regulate them and keep them in check, and those regulatory systems had multiple other systems to regulate and keep them in check, etc., etc., which was fine as long as somebody was available to play kind of Phantom of the Opera organist with them all to keep them all running and keep all the plates spinning. But when you started to lose a few of them, you could sometimes end up with complete cascade failure, a bit like South Dakota's electronics. Now, luckily for the Germans, it didn't happen too often, 
well, at least as far as we know of, because obviously the ships that got sunk, it's a bit difficult to tell. But it is a weakness. But as I say, I would be a bit more tentative about that identification. Tomasz Dudkiewicz, I think, asks, I read somewhere once in a Polish popular book that the night before the Dunkirk evacuation started, two Allied destroyers, the Bliskowice and HMS Vega, entered the port of Dunkirk to deter- and determined that it was usable. I tried some light digging and I could only find a single Polish and no British sources confirming it. Did such a mission happen, and if so, why wasn't the port used for evacuation in the end? So, there does seem to be a little bit of a weird dichotomy going on with this one, because HMS Vega, for instance, doesn't have a Dunkirk battle honour, which would it mean that, by at least by acknowledged Royal Navy records, she had nothing to do with it. But I was able to find at least two sources from people who served aboard HMS Vega at the time who actually concurred that both her and Bliskovica went in to check out the port the night before the evacuation started. So I'm going to tentatively lean on the side of they did do so, but perhaps it wasn't very well recorded or perhaps for some reason it was locked up in a file as somewhat secret and then has been overlooked or lost since. In any case, the reason why the port itself wasn't used for evacuation for the bulk of the Dunkirk evacuation was that whilst it may have well have been intact the night before, the opening day of the evacuation, the Luftwaffe bombed the port quite heavily and badly damaged its capability to support ships and both vessels had to navigate around various wrecks. Now, whilst they were able to do so, I would think if I was in the um, in the shoes of the people organising the evacuation, it would become very clear to me very quickly that not only are the port facilities, you know, relatively speaking, easy targets compared to some of the breakwaters where a lot of the evacuation was done or the beaches where other parts of the evacuation were done, but if a ship was hit if it was hit alongside in the port facilities it could completely wreck the ability to use a good section of the port facilities and if it was hit and managed to put off and then sink or was hit on its way in or out and then sank with the existing wrecks already there it could very rapidly make the entire thing impassable and worst case scenario it could possibly trap a bunch of other ships that were in the port evacuating and then they wouldn't be able to get out so while there are some indications that a degree of evacuation was done from the port itself it wasn't a huge amount and it very quickly tailed off the more the Luftwaffe bombed the place and thus obviously most of the evacuations then take place off the breakwaters and the beaches in the outer harbour. Vokir asks when playing Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts I've noticed that casement guns weigh significantly more than turrets of the same calibre and in some cases less than a twin or triple mount. Is this accurate, and what are the weight and stability differences between a casement and turret-mounted armament? I had a bit of a play around myself, and I think this may have to do partly with the settings that you have for the default armour for the turrets and casements. And that seems to vary not just by nation, but also by year. I tried building a couple of different dreadnoughts in the 1910 era, and discovered that the armour allocations for secondary turrets and secondary casements of the same calibre was very different to if I tried to build a 1935 modernised dreadnought with casements and turrets. And if I then equalised the amount of armour on both, then that changed the weight differences and which one was heavier and which one was lighter quite considerably. Generally speaking, all things being equal, a turret should weigh more than a casement because a casement only has to have the gun and an armour plate that is facing outwards, whereas a turret, in theory, if it's armoured, has to have, well, doesn't necessarily have to have armour all around of the same thickness, but has to have a similar, at least a similar level of thickness up front, and then it has to also have a roof and sides. And of course, the vast majority of secondary guns that were mounted in turrets or mounts tend to be twins as opposed to singles, which are in the casement. So normally, a secondary in a turret or a mount will weigh more 
than its equivalent in a casement and will have a greater stability effect because it's usually a deck higher. Although again, this can vary somewhat depending on exactly which ship you're stripping the casements out of. Now, of course, you could have secondaries that are basically only splinter proof with say an inch of steel. And when you compare that to six inches, which was a typical armor thickness on a casement, you might then flip the weight of the armor protection around somewhat, depending on the size of casements and the size of the turret or mount. Adam Schindler asks, could the US Navy's airships ever have been a useful scouting force with some kind of plausible but never implemented technology such as radar added? The lack of any rigid airship development in the decade since seems to indicate that they really were death traps, but the core idea still seems appealing. Well, Macon was actually doing a relatively decent job of being a scout with her aircraft until she had her accident which resulted in her crash landing into the water. The addition of aircraft does seem to have made a huge difference. In the early fleet problems when the Los Angeles, as pictured here, was around, one of the big problems they had was that if you encountered particularly high winds at altitude, it could almost stalemate the ability of the airship to make any particular progress, especially any progress that was any significantly faster than the fleet beneath it. Whereas once you had an airship that could launch its own scout aircraft, well, at that point, the ship itself, whether or not it was effectively stationary or moving at a relatively swift clip on its own, could still exercise quite a wide range of control. And of course, if the weather was good, it could fly around and do its own reconnaissance and it could go to other areas or home or wherever or come out to support the fleet significantly faster than an aircraft carrier, which would otherwise have a superior operational capability both in terms of types of aircraft and numbers of aircraft that it could carry. I personally think a lot of the problems related to interwar airship development came about because the countries that were doing the most experiments with them, that being Britain and America, although France also did some, um, and one or two other countries gave it a shot, basically came down to they were relatively speaking untested technologies. The Germans had the bulk of the experience in constructing airships, but of course in the immediate aftermath of World War One, they weren't really allowed to. Um, and I think that that didn't help because the you know if you have a prototype aircraft, uh, then you might build a dozen prototypes, and if two or three of them crash, then the lessons from those are applied to the others, and the others get better, and then the aircraft enters serious production. With the sheer size and cost of airships, you, your prototype is also kind of very expensive and needs to earn its keep by actually being active. And when you consider that, apart from Los Angeles and Shenandoah, the Akron and Macon are effectively the first US military airships, the other two having been constructed in whole or in part in Germany, the fact that both of them ended up in some way, shape or form coming to a sticky end is not necessarily surprising when you think of them as prototype aircraft of a brand new design. But the expense of their loss meant that the whole thing is curtailed. I think if you'd gotten them to World War II, as I've mentioned uh, a few times before, or their even larger successes that were planned, they're not going to be particularly useful in the fleet scouting role that people thought they were going to be used for. They're far too vulnerable to long-range fighters at that point. But where they could be very useful would be anti-submarine convoy escort because they've got the ability to hang around for a long period of time. They offer an excellent, relatively stationary, very high-altitude observation platform to look out for submarines. The submarines can't really do all that much about them. The convoys don't really move fast enough for anything other than really, really severe weather to be a problem. There could be some issues with long-range aircraft like Condors going after them, but if they're carrying their own fighter dash anti-submarine aircraft force, you can launch those to deal with incoming Condors. And of course, they are nice high-altitude platforms with a relatively decent lift capacity, so you could actually legitimately mount air search and later surface search radars on them, and they could effectively form maybe the world's first AWACS, which would be quite interesting. So 
they could be useful in that sense but i think by the time if people have been willing to throw more money at the pro programs by the time anybody had managed to iron out all of the issues and get them to be generically reliable fighter aircraft as a whole would have overtaken them as um, aerial scouts andrew dederer asks while the royal navy didn't have quite as strict requirements for officers as the army gatekeeping being mostly requiring recommendations fees and enough pull to get you signed on board to build seniority why was there no equivalent of the purchase system I take it half pay was the retirement carrot, but what kept the Navy more or less professional, as in doing their own navigation, etc.? I think because if you want to be relatively crude about it, at its core, it's a lot more difficult to get your entire command killed in the army in peacetime. In wartime, that is a very different matter. But, you know, even with the purchase system, the army usually could self-correct during peacetime and definitely began to self-correct quite quickly during wartime uh, because apart from anything else if you're in a foot regiment and it's very clear that your purchase colonel has no idea what he's doing and is about to march you off into the massed guns of a French a 10,000 strong French column he's probably going to meet with a creative accident and everybody's going to go elsewhere but when we go back to the regular peacetime period whether your colonel knows anything at all about military tactics or not probably doesn't make a huge amount of odds to a 17th or 18th century peacetime army soldier because it you know your colonel under most circumstances is not going to be so awful the you know the ground opens up and swallows your regiment whole or you know your barracks collapses or you know he marches you straight off of a cliff i mean he might march off a cliff but everybody else will just go well i'm not going to do that then and so there is less consequences for failure whereas if you have someone who has let's say become a purchase captain had that system existed in the royal navy and just bought their way into commanding one of his or her majesty's finest warships well even in peacetime it a uh, captain who has knows nothing about what he's doing is probably going to run the ship aground at best if not sail off into the middle of the ocean and get flipped by a storm or smashed by an iceberg or eaten by a kraken or something at worst very very quickly and not only is the loss of the warship incredibly expensive for their navy and they're going to be very annoyed about that but there's precious little the men can do about it right up until it becomes so blatantly obvious the captain doesn't know what he's doing that everyone rises up in mutinies but that's by that point it's probably too late you know the ship's probably already on the rocks and there were enough warships lost to going aground even when the captains knew what they were doing because sometimes you just can't fight the weather um and so I think it's basically that is just the consequences of being an utter failure are so, so much higher when you're in the Navy in, in high command that it forced people, no matter whether they liked it or not, to generally have to go with at least a modicum of talent for the command and navigation of a ship. And finally, Dr. Irrelevant asks... Please use the following link to provide us with your World War II battleship tier list based purely on aesthetics. Link in the video description. Well, I don't know about anyone else, if anyone else wants to try the link, whether it's a problem with my browser or what, but when the tier maker came up, the pictures were absolutely tiny. Um, so I really couldn't see all that much detail. Fortunately, I think i recognized about 95 percent of them just by profile and outline so i did my best um i think and i think broadly speaking this would be my tier list for appearance appearance wise but um, obviously feel free to play around with it yourself and see what you come up with but uh here's my here's drax squint at very pixely photos to try and determine aesthetics list um i yeah have fun and that's it for today thank you very much for watching everybody and i uh, hope to see you again in another video